Hello, Packer fans. Welcome into this Wednesday edition of the Pack a Day podcast here on YouTube. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. So it happened. Kevin King is officially back as a Green Bay Packer. Um, I kind of alluded to in the last couple of days that it's at least within the realm of possibility. I uh, mentioned him yesterday as a corner that Green Bay could realistically sign still in free agency. It shouldn't come as a massive surprise, even though to me it's still surprising. I didn't think they would do it after the NFC Championship game. Definitely, as I mentioned two days ago, not what I would do. I'm not going to spend a ton of time today discussing Kevin King and what he is and what he isn't and what this deal means. If you want my thoughts on Kevin King, I gave them very candidly a couple days ago, and certainly my mind hasn't been changed on anything since that time. The thing with Kevin King is we know he has talent. We don't have to go back much further than 2019 to see that he has the ability to put together a full season. And as I mentioned on Twitter, you know, even this past year in 2020, up until the NFC Championship game before that, I basically had a neutral level grade on Kevin King. And that may not sound like anything too exciting, but that basically means that it's a player that's not winning the game for you, but he's not losing it for you either. And at the cornerback position specifically, and especially when Jair Alexander's on the other side, that has a ton of value. Now, unfortunately, in the NFC Championship game, he was my second lowest player, graded defensive player in any game over the last four years since I started grading. So that's a major problem. And I think that's ultimately the issue with Kevin King is it's that inconsistency. As I discussed the other day, you don't know if you're getting an A or if you're getting an F on any given day. And that is the toughest thing as a coach. I would rather have a C minus player that I knew was going to be a C minus every day. So I know if I have to cover for him, uh, put an extra guy behind him, like to some extent, there's almost a a benefit to having like a, a Ladarius Gunter where you know exactly what you're getting and you're not expecting more than having a Kevin King where you literally don't know. He might go and shut down the opposing receiver just all game, or he might give up a deep touchdown to Scotty Miller in the most inopportune time. And you just don't know. And that's the most frustrating thing with Kevin King is even the things that he's good at, you just don't know if it's going to be consistent. So I, for one, am hoping like hell that I'm wrong. I would love to eat my words and I would love to see him go and ball the hell out and play opposite Jair Alexander and go get a massive payday this next season with whatever team wants to pay him a ton of money because he went out and balled out in 2021 and helped Green Bay win games and hopefully win a Super Bowl. That sounds amazing to me. And again, as I mentioned, we don't know, at least as I'm recording this, the terms of the deal, one year, six million, we know, but we don't know if that's incentive-based. I'm assuming it is. Again, I'm guessing it's going to be like a one-year, three million plus incentives on top of that to get it potentially to six million, and so they can report it as a one-year, six million. And I bet, remember, just yesterday or two days ago, I said, you know, if, if it's me and it's one year, two million, I can understand it. Maybe don't love it, but I can certainly understand it. And this is one year, three million plus incentives. Don't love it, but I can understand it. And especially with where the cornerback market was, especially where the cornerback, um, you know, position is on the roster. Again, don't love it, but I can understand. And the other thing is it doesn't matter right, if, if I love it, right? Like I'm not naive enough to think that I'm the be all end all with decisions and who's best for the Packers and who's not. Like there's a there's a world where Kevin King goes out and has an awesome year this year. And again, we don't have to go back further than 2019 to see that he's capable of putting together a solid season. Let's just hope now that that's the case and that he can show that and live up to the expectations of what Green Bay originally drafted him as and now bringing him back for a second contract, even if it is only a one-year likely prove-it type deal. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, and it's very apparent to just about everybody now, Green Bay's banking on their own. They have gone out of their way this offseason to keep their own guys. Dean Lowry, Kevin King, Chandon Sullivan, Preston Smith, Aaron Jones, Guys, they could have cut like a Preston Smith and Dean Lowry that at, up to this point, they haven't. They've kept their own guys. And I know Corey Lindsley's gone. Remember, they're not generally in the business of giving out third contracts to offensive linemen. Bakhtiari is kind of the exception to the rule. That shouldn't be massive, massively surprising. Jamal Williams, it was always going to be probably only one of the running backs at best. They chose Aaron Jones, understandably so. A.J. Dillon's going to be that number two. There just isn't space, time, room, anything for, for Jamal Williams on the roster. So that makes sense. But outside of that, they're really keeping their own on this roster. Even Devin Funches, again, another player that I didn't necessarily expect. Like if you would have told me all those guys would have been back uh, a month ago, Lowry, King, Sullivan, Preston, Aaron Jones, and Devin Funches, I would have said you were absolutely freaking crazy. I would have said there's no way in hell. No, no way in hell. And I would have been wrong. And I am wrong. So we'll see what happens. And I think 
the, the, the one underrated thing, and again, I'm not pumping this up as something that I think is super amazing or whatever, but if you're, if you're a player on the Green Bay Packers, the Packers just put their faith in their own players. They put their faith in their own team. They said, you know what? We think you guys were a Super Bowl team last year, and we are going to get everyone back, and we're going to do it again this year, and we're going to go out and win a Super Bowl this year. We have faith in our own guys. We're going to bring you back. And we're going to go out and deliver this season, and it and it it, it 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 you know it is something that is going to be infectious, I think, throughout the team. But if you're a Preston Smith, if you're a Kevin King, if you're a Chandon Sullivan, if you're a Dean Lowry, and he ultimately does end up back, they, again, they had faith in those guys to keep them around when they could have let them walk elsewhere, cut them, release them, not you know not resign them, and they had faith enough to bring those guys back. And especially with Kevin King, Preston Smith, Dean Lowry, Chandon Sullivan, those guys are all on either either one year deals or pseudo one year deals like Preston Smith. It's this it's really a one year deal coming forward. All of them have every incentive to play well this year, as Green Bay just showed them faith in bringing them back, gave them the opportunity to prove themselves. My guess is Kevin King and Preston Smith are going to have heavy incentives in their contract. And now they're going to be free agents next year with an increasing salary cap. That's a best case scenario for those guys. And, you know, in a business where it's pretty cutthroat, and listen, I'm not saying Aaron Jones took less money to come to Green Bay. Like he did them a favor. And Preston Smith had to take a salary cut to come back to Green Bay. So I'm not saying this is all just one sided and Green Bay's doing everyone favors here. But Green Bay had the opportunity to go in opposite directions, sign guys from outside, and they decided to keep their own. And I have to believe that that's something that's going to resonate with the locker room, resonate for the players, and be something that they can really rally around, that they think that they don't need a, a high price free agent. They don't need somebody from a different locker room. They have the guys in that locker room to go compete. And I think that's going to be a talking point for Matt LaFleur, that they think they played their shittiest game at the worst time, and that they are not going to let that happen again, and that they're going to go out and win a Super Bowl. Will it happen? It's going to be a wait and see approach. And I, you know, I'm of the belief personally that if you're not getting better, if you're not taking that next step, adding that next player, if you're just staying stagnant, that's taking a step back. And if you take it from an outsider's lens, right? Let's take our Packer sunglasses off for a second. If I would have told you any other team this offseason would have kept their team basically status quo but lost an all-pro offensive lineman and hired Joe Barry as their defensive coordinator, and that was their offseason, what would you have said? You probably would have said they took a major step back, right? No, I mean, nobody going into this offseason had any faith in a Joe Barry as a defensive coordinator. Nobody was pounding the table saying, we got to get Joe Barry. That's the guy. And I'm not saying he can't be, right? I'm just saying that's not what anyone was thinking. And I don't think anyone's being like, you know, well, we would love to lose our all pro offensive linemen. Like that's what we're hoping for. Like if, if your off season consists of losing an all pro on the offensive line, losing some depth, Jamal Williams, Christian Kirksey, Rick Wagner, Raven Green, and bringing in Joe Barry as defensive coordinator, and that's your off season. I don't care what team it was. You would say that that team got worse. And you might say, well, we, you know, we really think that our younger guys are going to step up. The other 31 teams think the same thing. You might say, well, they're still going to be able to address some of those holes and get better in the draft. The other 31 teams can say the same thing. And guess what? Like 28 of the 31 teams have a better draft overall capital than what Green Bay has. So I'm not saying that this is impossible. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying they can't be better. I'm not saying they can't win a Super Bowl. In fact, as I mentioned the other day, I think they're easy. they win the NFC North easy. I think they win it easy. I think they are one of the four, maybe five teams in the NFC that can actually win a Super Bowl. I think the NFC West and maybe one or two teams that end up on top of the NFC West, Tampa Bay and Green Bay are ultimately going to be your final teams again. I haven't seen any other team that's stepped up to the point where I think they're going to be ready to compete with any of those teams. I think a lot of the teams in the NFC have actually taken a step back or gotten worse or at least stayed, stayed status quo. And I think they're going to be able to compete with any of those teams. And I do think there's young guys that are going to step up and play better. And I do think they have the ability to put together a good draft class. But 
they're going to have to have guys step up. They're going to have to do well in that draft class. And they're going to have to come together and play better in some certain, you know, some key, some key spots than they did a season ago. And I think the biggest thing, if you want to be hopeful for this season, is I said going into last year, and I believe this going into the season, I thought Kenny Clark, Preston Smith, Zedaria Smith, Rashawn Gary had the ability to be one of the absolute best fronts in the NFL, if not the best front in the NFL. And they weren't even close. Zedarius, Preston, Kenny, and Rashawn collectively have the ability to play at an ex- exponentially higher level than they did a season ago. And if that happens and everything else stays status quo, to me, they're a top Super Bowl contender. Just if that happens, if everything else stays the same and that group up front, Z, Preston, Rashawn, Gary, Kenny Clark play up to their potential, they're a Super Bowl team, if not a Super Bowl winner, just in that in and of itself. So there are ways for this team to be better. They just need a lot of things to go right. They don't have quite the depth that they had, at least at this point, uh, I think a season ago. Um, Injuries will be very telling for how they're able to kind of fill in for some of those. And again, the Chris Barneses, the Kingsley Kikis, the Garys, the Savages, the DeGuaras, the Sternbergers, the Dillons, the John Runyon Juniors. Those are guys that are going to have to step up and play better um, just year after year over the course of the next couple of seasons. So I don't think this is doom and gloom. I don't think this is anything other than bringing back a corner at a almost vet minimum deal and hoping that he can get back into his 2019 form. Last but not least, I just want to go over one corner. I, you know, I don't think bringing, and I know bringing back Kevin King doesn't change Green Bay's draft plans at all, right? They have one corner on the roster right now that they're counting on in 2022, and that's Jair Alexander. There's no guarantee King is back, Sullivan, Ento, you know, Kadar Hallman, Josh Jackson, anyone. The only corner that has a lock spot on this team in 2022 is Jair Alexander. So they are still going to be very interested in corners in this upcoming draft. And I think now with Kevin King back and Chandon Sullivan back, one name that makes a ton of sense, and I'll probably be covering the corners quite a bit more, in, at least before the draft in one of these episodes, because um, I did do the Cheesehead TV draft guide for corners. Make sure to pre-order if you haven't already, cheap plug. But uh, one name that really interests me is um, Aaron Robinson, the, the corner from University of Central Florida. And you know, he's not my favorite corner in this draft by far. I think he ended up at like number eight on my list of corners. But one of the things that's really interesting to me about Robinson is that he should come in and start over Sullivan, in my opinion, from day one, and and at least give him a fight for everything he's got in training camp to start as nickel corner. To me, he's going to be the the best nickel corner out of this draft. Um, But I think on top of that, he has the ability to play outside as well. And I don't think he's limited to just inside. And I think he can actually be a good corner outside. And I think what that could potentially do is allow you to play Jair and King outside with Alan, excuse me, Aaron Robinson uh, inside. And then, you know, use Chandon Sullivan in a dime role, can play some safety, can play some nickel and, and or some slot. And I think that gives you some versatility there. But if something happens with Kevin King, he has one of his injuries, um, just doesn't play up to par, anything like that. I think you could legitimately go Aaron Robinson on the outside and then have Sullivan play in the slot and uh, with Jair on the other side, and you could do that. And I think even moving forward, you know, if if as, as you're going into next year, um, you know, I think that allows you then to have Jair and then a versatile piece in Aaron Robinson, where you know if you end up with you know another slot corner via free agency in the draft in 2022, you can play Robinson outside. If you get an outside corner or you bring King back or Jackson back or somebody outperforms and you need somebody in the slot, well, Robinson, that's what he's probably going to be best at. So it just gives you some really interesting versatility. And I think with Kevin King, Jair Alexander, Shannon Sullivan all in tow, um, I think you know, Aaron Robinson could be somebody that makes a lot of sense. Just quick scouting report. Again, six feet, 190, redshirt senior out of UCF. I would have liked to have seen a bit more ball production from him this last season. No picks, just six pass breakups. But a lot of that was due to having sticky coverage. Very fluid, great hit movement, great transitions. Um, very physical at the line of scrimmage. Nothing faces him, whether it's a small, shifty 5'10 guy. In fact, Kadarius Toney, Aaron Robinson was like was literally like the only guy in senior bowl practices that could stick with Kadarius Toney one-on-one in, in those drills. Like and Tony got the best of him at times too, but Robinson was the only one that had like any level of success against him. He also doesn't have issues with bigger, more physical slot receivers. He has the, the bulk and the size to hang with those guys as well. Again, can play inside, outside, can play man, can play zone, and he's completely unafraid of playing inside either, which in this day and age is getting tougher and tougher with all the different players that can play inside on the slot. 
Definitely needs to work on his footwork. Definitely needs to work on angles and, and what angles he takes to the football as he's, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, flipping his hips and turning and running with the receivers can definitely take some better angles in that regards. Also needs better spatial awareness and zone and better trail technique and man. So some technique stuff that, of course, any rookie needs to work on. But to me, he's a day one starter in the slot, can play that star position. Again, um, Joe Barry mentioned in his one press conference so far that you can't have enough guys that can play the star position. To me, this is the best guy in the draft. I know a lot of people love Elijah Molden. Elijah Molden played the slot better than Aaron Robinson did in college, no question about it. But I think Robinson projects better as an NFL slot and star player than what Molden does. I think Molden might eventually have to end up in a Micah Hyde type, Hyde type safety role. And Molden and Hyde, very similar type players in my opinion. So love the versatility, love that I think he can start from day one, plus has you know potential down the road to potentially be a starting outside corner or slot corner if you need him. Um, and I, again, I just love that versatility. So just a name to keep an eye on. I don't think he's worth pick 29. Some people may disagree with me on that. Um, some people have him as a firm first round pick. I think he's more in late, late, uh, excuse me, early second, mid second round range. To me, if he gets to you at you know end of second round, he's a no brainer. Uh, he might be a little bit in no man's land where you either need to you know trade down in round one or trade up in round two to secure his services, but um, definitely a name to keep an eye on nonetheless. That's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for joining me. As always, I'll be right back here tomorrow. Make sure to check out Dusty, Steven, Sarah on today's audio podcast. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.